Okay, why don't we talk about special revelation then? Um, what is special revelation? Why do we need special revelation? What's included in special revelation? So once again, we're, we're narrowing the focus, okay? So we started the class with the need for special revelation. Um, or we started the class with the need for revelation. Just epistemology, epistemology, right? If we're going to know anything about God, God must reveal it. Then we got to doctrine of revelation. Then we got to general revelation. <clears throat> now we're getting to special revelation, and we're going to keep narrowing it down. Special revelation. Special revelation. Uh, a definition. I'm going to offer two definitions. The first by Jeff Perswell. It's God's revelation of himself to particular persons. God's revelation of himself to particular persons at specific times and places. God's revelation of himself to particular persons at specific times and places through special means in order to enable them to enter into a saving relationship with him. God's revelation of himself to particular persons at specific times and places, through special means, to enable them to enter into a saving relationship with him. Here's a longer definition by Bavink. Oh, sure. God's revelation of himself to particular persons at specific times and places, through special means, to enable them to enter into saving relationship with him. Here's Babink. It's not short, so just take it in. That conscious and free act of God by which he, in the way of historical complex of special means, and he gives three, theophany, prophecy, and miracle, that contributed to the person of Christ makes himself known specifically in the attributes of justice and grace, in the proclamation of law and gospel to those human beings who live in the light of this special revelation, so that they may accept the grace of God by faith in Christ, or in the case of the impenitent, receive more severe judgment. So let's think about special revelation in contrast to general. Let's start there. Um, first, in scope. General revelation is made generally available to all people. General revelation is made generally available to all people and at all times, right? Um, you don't need to be there in the moment. You don't need to be there in the moment. It's, just, it's always available since the creation of the world, Romans 1. So its scope is general, both in audience and in time. In audience and in time. Its content, then, is also general. It's general content. Um, some things about God in a more general way. Special revelation is more specific. It, it reveals to us the way of salvation through Christ. That's what it's meant to do. Reveal to us this way of salvation in Christ. Um, look, at, look at Romans one nineteen again for this contrast. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. What, what may be known about God seems to, it's a very general language, and it seems to be in contrast to the fullness of God's revelation in the gospel. What might be known about God through them, right? Um, verse of the fullness of God's revelation in the gospel. Finally, it's efficacy. All right. General revelation is insufficient by design to accomplish God's purposes in revelation. General revelation is insufficient by design to accomplish God's purposes in revelation. He reveals to make friends with us. General revelation is insufficient to do that. Special revelation, though, is always effectual, either in saving the elect or condemning the non-elect. 
It's always efficient. It always accomplishes God's purposes. So the, the necessity of special revelation then, it's, it's, ne- it's necessary. It's necessary. So, so if the purpose of revelation is for God to enter into a relationship with his people, then we need something beyond general revelation to accomplish that goal. Something else is needed. We need something that communicates to us God's saving purposes in Christ. Because general revelation does not. So, so what makes general revelation insufficient? First, it's not insufficient because God is unclear. It's not insufficient because God is unclear. And it's not inadequate because God does not provide enough of it, so that if we had more general revelation, then we would be fully convinced of Christianity. So that's contrasting evidential apologetics. Well, what makes general revelation insufficient is two things. Number one, man's fall. Man's fall. So that although the heavens declare the glories of God, Psalm 19, verse 1, The thought of the wicked every day is, there is no God. Psalm 14, verse 1. What makes it insufficient is, first, man's fallen state, and number two, because it was always designed to be supplemented by special revelation, ever since the beginning of the world. Now, uh, Gerhardus Voss, in his book, Biblical Theology, which we have in the back, helpfully distinguishes, uh, there's multiple ways to distinguish uh, special revelation, but why don't we start with temporal, okay? And in, in, if we're talking on temporal categories, um, the, disting- the, the distinction would be pre-fall and post-fall. Pre-fall, special revelation, and post-fall, special revelation. Um, so, so the entrance of sin, in the entrance of sin into history, God adapts His special revelation to meet our need in our fallen state. Okay, both in meeting our need for redemption and in accommodating to our fallen wills and our fallen minds. So, so the result is this: we learn new things about God after the fall after sin entered into the world that we would not have known before the fall. We don't know about God's mercy or grace or patience to the same degree that we do now than we did before the fall. So let's consider pre-fall special revelation. First of all, not all special revelation is post-fall. It's not all post-fall. There is pre-fall special revelation. There's a problem... I think, to limiting special revelation to simply being, this is, I want to be careful as I say this, limiting it simply to being redemptive in nature. Okay, it's always for the purpose of bringing us into a relationship with God, but that doesn't mean it's always redemptive in nature. There's, There's always verbal special revelation, and the garden is no exception, but in the garden, it's not redemptive in nature, but it is for the purpose of entering into eternal relationship with God. So, so it is always for the purpose of uh, friendship, but it's not always for the purpose of redemption. So, and I, I say that in a certain way, right? Because although God did speak to Adam before the fall, um, in what theologians classically have called the covenant of works, obey and you will live, um, Adam was never able to do it. So, so even in God's law, it was intended to reveal to him his need for Christ. But most on the surface, we can say this, pre-fall, pre-fall special revelation functioned to bring Adam into relationship with God, but not redemptively. And, and most special revelation is post-fall, so in that sense we can conceive of it as being redemptive in nature. Now, 
It's necessary because, first of all, God's a speaking God. God's a speaking God. And so, within himself, it would be inadequate for him to simply reveal through creation. No, there must be something special. And we see that in Genesis 1. Through the repetition, and God said, and God said, and God said. God spoke before the fall. Genesis 2.16, God commanded before the fall. There's There's a foundational reality then in God's special revelation that he is a speaking God even before the fall. The functional, the functional reality, though, is that God speaks to all of his creation for the purpose of fellowship. Okay, for the purpose of fellowship. So let's look at Genesis 2, 17, and we'll talk more about this in hermeneutics class, where God says this to Adam, You may eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then we find, so that's that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but we find in Genesis 3, 8, that if Adam had, if Adam had eaten of the tree of life, what would have happened? He would have lived forever, right? Which means that in the middle of the garden, there is a tree that if Adam had eaten of it, he would have lived forever, yet he hadn't done it yet. So God's special revelation was intended to to show him that that should he live in perpetual faithfulness and perpetual obedience, he would have been granted access to this tree of life and lived forever. Again, it's for the purpose of making friends with us. And we'll talk more about this in hermeneutics, of course. It's also necessary because of the creator-creature distinction. We were made to receive from God. We were made to receive from God even before the fall. Now, in post-fall special revelation, the content shifts. The content shifts. Um, Now, this is important because sin did not make special revelation necessary, but it did change its purpose. Sin did not make special revelation necessary, but it did change its purpose. And we we could say that the purpose of special revelation has always been that Man would enter into eternal life with God, both before the fall and after. But in after the fall, it's meant to restore man. It's meant to restore man in his relationship with God and not simply confirm him in his relationship with God. And this means the grace of God is more amplified in post-fall special revelation. Revelation has always been a gracious act of God, right? Special revelation has always been a gracious act of God. But, but the fact that God reveals after we sin amplifies our understanding of his graciousness. He doesn't have to do that, and he does. We're, we're, we're even more undeserving, which amplifies our understanding of his grace. So that's, that's the temporal category. So we pre-fall and post-fall special revelation. Any questions on that? Yeah, it's not like Adam and Eve could sit around, again, that, that picture of sitting around the coffee shop. Adam and Eve couldn't sit around the coffee shop and say, well, I think God's like this. Well, I think God's like this, right? That, by virtue of the fact that we're creatures, right? Our, di- our distinction between us and God is first ontological and then it's moral, right? Um, we've always needed revelation. And we've always needed special revelation. Great question. Let's consider then the nature, the nature of special revelations. That's temporal categories. Let's talk about the nature. Um, What what is it? Um, Number one, it's historical. It's historical. So, So special revelation always comes in history and through history, through events in history, and through words spoken in space and time, right? God on the mountain, right? God in the garden, right? And he's always speaking in space and time and not outside of space and time. Um, It's essential then for revelation to be revelation that actually reveals that God speak and God act in events that we can understand and see and take in, right? Um, that, that means also that the historicity of the events of Scripture is really important. 
to put it mildly. It's, it, it's, at, it's essential. The events have to be historical, because if they're not historical, um, then, then God didn't reveal in history. Right? If there was never an Exodus event, and there was never a Mount Sinai, then God didn't reveal in the Exodus event, and God didn't reveal at Mount Sinai. If there was never a Noah, and there was never an Abraham, and there was never a David, then God never revealed to them in history. It would be someone imagining things outside of history, which is contra how the Bible presents itself. The Bible presents itself as historical. That's number one. Number two, it's redemptive. It's redemptive. It's given to us for entering into full fellowship with God, contrasting general revelation, which is meant to show us its own limitations so that we would run to special revelation and find in it um, everything that we need in Christ. That, that means if it is redemptive by nature, then that means it's Christ-centered, Right? If it's redemptive in nature, then that means it is Christ-centered. So it's redemptive and therefore Christ-centered. Next, it's progressive. It's progressive. Um, general revelation is just it's just there. Right? It's just psh, there for you, for everyone to see. It doesn't progress. It doesn't expand. Later general revelation doesn't interpret earlier general revelation or anything like that. Uh, rather, special revelation is different. Special revelation unfolds slowly, is revealed slowly. It's progressive. It unfolds the plan slowly. Um, not that it changes, okay? It doesn't change. But later revelation makes earlier revelation more clear. It makes it more clear. Um, and it doesn't contradict itself, so that later revelation never contradicts earlier revelation, but rather makes more clear what was said in earlier revelation. Finally, um, mo its mode... So there's three modes of special revelation. Um, the first is theophany. Where God appears. Okay? God appears, I'll take that in a second. God appears as a cloud. God appears as a fire. God appears as a finger. God appears in some kind of visual, audio, something. Right? Number two would be prophecy. Yeah, theophany. Theophany. Two is prophecy, where God speaks. And three is miracle. Where he acts. Um, and all three of these are seen to the greatest degree in Christ, Right? Um, in that sense, it's all Christ-centered. The theophany, where God is appearing in physical form, is seen most clearly in Christ, God made flesh. Prophecy is seen most clearly in Christ, the Word of God incarnate. And miracle, obviously the miracle of the incarnation is the greatest of all miracles, which means that all special revelation is centered in, it's, it's merging in the Christ event. Okay, that's... That's just an introduction to what special revelation is. Um, what is the relationship between special revelation and Scripture? What's the relationship between special revelation and Scripture? Now, first of all, special revelation is not identical to Scripture. Right? They're not one to one. They can't be. By our definition, theophany, prophecy, and miracle, right? So, so the Bible is not a theophany, right? 
So it, they can't, they're not one-to-one, -one, so that if you say special revelation, it's not a synonym for the Bible, right? And if you say the Bible, it's not a synonym for special revelation. By, by definition, special revelation in Scripture cannot be identical, and that's Reformed tradition and outside of Reformed tradition, people agree with that. The, that's number one, is just by definition there has to be a distinction. But number two, temporally there has to be a distinction, right? There's a temporal gap between the events and the recording of those events. Or the word spoken and the writing down of those words spoken. The, 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 the exceptions would be the moments when God speaks directly, but even there it has to be written down, or like the Ten Commandments maybe, but even, even there the Ten Commandments aren't the Bible, right? The stone tablets are not the Bible, right? We, the, what was written on the stone tablets is recorded later, um, but what God wrote with his finger on the stone tablets isn't the Bible, right? Um, the Bible is, includes people copying down what God wrote with his finger. So this, there's a temporal gap between events and words. Or you could say events and words and inspired scripture even, right? There's a gap there. So that just because, like, when we read in Genesis 1 about God creating the world, right, it's, it's, not like, it's not like there was a page there that the Holy Spirit was, like, writing it down on, right? And it happened far later that it was recorded. Uh, John Feinberg says this uh, in his book, Light in a Dark Place, the Doctrine of Scripture. Before there was Scripture, there was divine revelation, and without divine revelation, there could be no Scripture. God was revealing before the Bible was written. Does that make sense? Um, scripture itself even testifies to the fact that there are things that God said that aren't included in Scripture. So, John 21, 25. There are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself cannot contain the books that would be written, right? So, there are things that Jesus said that I'm sure some of them, uh, some of them were simple, like, could, could you give me... Uh, I'll take the burger without the tomato, right? Some of them were things like that, right? Uh, or, you know, my ball, right? Things like that. That would not be considered special revelation. But I'm sure there were other things that he said that, that John seems to think would be significant enough to write down besides hold the tomato. Um, or can, I have, can you pass the shawarma sauce? Like that, there seems to be things that were, would be significant enough to write down mm -hmm. that were not written down which means God didn't preserve them, which means they're not Scripture, because God preserves Scripture. So that, that's number one. Scripture itself testifies to the fact that God speaks beyond, God spoke beyond what was written, but there's also prophecies from Old Testament non-writing prophets, right? Are there any words that Elijah or Elisha wrote down? No, there's not. Which means the words that Elijah and Elisha spoke were not scripture. But they were special revelation. But they're not scripture. Or you think of Saul, right? Remember um, in 1 Samuel 10, verse 11. And when all the people knew Saul previously, saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, what has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? But there's no book of Saul in our Bible. I don't even know who these other prophets were that he was prophesying with. But their words aren't written down in the Bible either. Or, think even of the 70 elders upon whom the Holy Spirit fell. right? And, and, and Moses said, oh, that all of God's people would prophesy like this but we don't have that written down for us, which means there was special revelation outside of what was written in the Bible. And, but even within our definition of theophany, theophany, prophecy, miracle, think about the miracle of the Red Sea parting, right? 
the parting of the Red Sea or the burning bush or the incarnation itself, those are written down about in the Bible, but the Bible isn't the burning bush, right? The Bible isn't the parting of the Red Sea. That was a miraculous event that was then recorded later and interpreted, right? So the Bible is two things then. The Bible is two things. One, the Bible is a record of special revelation. And two, it is itself special revelation. It's a record of special revelation, and it is special revelation, right? So let's think about first the Bible is a record of special revelation. So it's a record of special revelation um, because Scripture records the words and deeds of God in history, right? God part of the Red Sea, and the Bible tells us about it. God spoke to Moses, and the Bible tells us about it. So Scripture then serves special revelation. Scripture serves special revelation to allow it to accomplish its redemptive purposes in a wider audience. Right? If, if God spoke at Sinai and no one ever wrote it down then it could only be redemptive for the people who heard it. If God parted the Red Sea and no one wrote about it, then it could only be redemptive for the people who were there. But by writing it down, it allows that moment or those words to serve a wider audience and thus serve the purpose of special revelation more broadly. Number two, special revelation generates scripture. Special revelation generates scripture. So as God reveals to his people, they record it. Right? Scripture is not given then apart from God speaking. Right? But as God speaks, God's people write it down. So there's four dangers, I think, in forgetting that special revelation is not equal to Scripture. Um, there's, there's four dangers in forgetting that Scripture is a record of special revelation. It is special revelation. I'm not denying that, but it's also a, a record of special revelation. There's four dangers. Um, one would be equating special revelation with Scripture to have too narrow a definition of special revelation. Because where... Miracle has to be put somewhere. Theophany has to be put somewhere. Or words that God spoke that aren't in Scripture have to be put somewhere, right? It's either general or special revelation. Understanding that Scripture is a subset of special revelation protects us from the danger of equating the two to say special revelation equals Scripture. Number, danger number two, assuming that all special revelation carries equal authority and equal necessity. It can't, because the Bible is unique, right? The Bible is more authoritative than seeing the Red Sea crossing in person. The Bible is more, this is what Peter says, right? Second Peter 121. Okay. We do not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the Father, when was that? When did he receive honor and glory from the Father? When the voice from heaven said, This is my Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And we heard his voice born from heaven on the holy mountain. That's the transfiguration, right? Transfiguration, special revelatory event. They saw Jesus in his glory. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Where do we have it more fully confirmed? In scripture. We have it more fully confirmed in scripture. To have the Bible is better than to see Jesus transfigured. The Bible is more... The transfiguration is not necessary to our salvation. 
It's a wonderful, special, revelatory event, but it's not necessary to our salvation. The Bible is. Without the Bible, we can't be saved. The Bible testifies to that moment. So, the, the transfiguration then, this is what Peter is saying, doesn't carry the same authority or necessity as the Bible. Not all special revelation carries the same authority and necessity. Danger number three. <clears throat> Danger number three, forgetting the historical events of special revelation, right? The Red Sea parting really happened. God really spoke in a still small voice to Elijah. The resurrection really happened. It's not just recorded about. Or it, the Bible doesn't just the Bible doesn't just tell us inspiring stories. The Bible tells us about special revelatory moments. <clears throat> Danger number four: forgetting the redemptive intention of Scripture. Forgetting the redemptive intention of Scripture. Uh, scripture records these special revelatory events for us so that we might enter into friendship with God, the God who did them. We weren't there, but it tells us about them. <clears throat> Number two, and I'll spend less time here because I think this is more obvious. The Bible is, Scripture is special revelation. Scripture is special revelation. First Peter 2, I'm sorry, 2 Peter <clears throat> one twenty one, men spoke from God. Men spoke from God, right? It's special revelation. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all Scripture is breathed out by God. It is special revelation. It is miracle. It is prophecy. So then, what is Scripture? Scripture is that portion of verbal revelation which God chose to preserve for His people. Scripture is that portion of verbal revelation which God chose to preserve for His people. He didn't choose to preserve all verbal revelation, as we've already seen, but some of it he has. So Scripture is that portion of verbal revelation which God has chosen to preserve for his people. It's a subset not just of special revelation, it's a subset of verbal special revelation. So the Bible is the, uh, the culminating act of special revelation and, and the concluding redemptive act of God in special revelation. Scripture is the written form of verbal revelation which God has preserved for his people. He, here's the implication then. Scripture, scripture is recorded verbal revelation, and not in a way that's less than actually being there, to hear the voice of God. It, it's, it's authentic revelation. It's just as authentic as God speaking audibly to you. It's just as real and it's just as authoritative because God chose to preserve it for his people. B.B. Warfield says this, Scripture is contrived from the point of view of the writers of the New Testament, not merely as a record of revelation, but is itself a part of the redemptive revelation of God. Not merely as a record of the redemptive acts by which God is saving the world, but as one of those redemptive acts, having its part to play in the great work of establishing and building up the kingdom of God. That means that Scripture is necessary. Scripture is necessary. It's necessary first to make God's verbal special revelation permanent. It's necessary to make it permanent. Calvin says this, for by his word, God rendered faith unambiguous forever. A faith that, shouldn't be that should be superior to all opinion. Finally, so that the truth might abide forever in the world, with a conscious succession of teaching and survive through the ages, the same oracle he had given to the patriarchs were his pleasure to have recorded 
as it were, on public tablets. So it makes it permanent, right? The fact that it's written makes it permanent. That's number one. Number two, it makes it universal. It makes it universal. It, it's located anywhere someone can get a copy. Now it's even more universal because you can just download the app on your phone, right? It locates God's authoritative, verbal, special revelation. Those words are very carefully chosen. God's authoritative, verbal, special revelation to a specific place, but yet at the same time a universal place. It's available in all places, and it's available in all generations. And that, that is why it serves a special place among all of God's special revelation. Next, number three, Scripture makes God's verbal special revelation coherent. Sh scripture makes God's verbal special revelation coherent. Because Scripture is the completed form of God's authoritative, verbal, special revelation, it can be coherent for us. We can, we can read it from beginning to end. We can, we can get all of it, get our minds around it, study it. We, we, aren't lift, we aren't left guessing the details of God's interaction with his people. God has given us every detail he desires for us to know. So we can do systematic theology from Scripture. And we don't need to look away from Scripture for answers. Finally, Scripture makes God's verbal special revelation objective. Scripture makes God's verbal special revelation objective. Um, there's no questioning what it says and what it didn't say. Um, we're not asking if we heard correctly. No, just look at the page. It's right there. Scripture can be objective. It can be a, a true source of knowledge, a true way of interpreting reality. It means that it's multi-generational. It means that all of the church can look to it and learn from it and, and observe the same book and the same words together and continue to glean new things from it. So then Scripture is unique of all of God's special revelatory acts. This is, this is what that means, right? If, if there was somebody, maybe a shepherd boy, not an Israelite, not an Egyptian, who just happened to observe the Red Sea crossing. Red Sea crossing, special revelatory act, yes or no? Yes. If he happened to observe it and write down what he saw there, it's not the Bible, right? Just because someone records God's special revelatory acts doesn't mean that it's the Bible. And how do we know? Because God didn't preserve it. God said he would preserve Scripture. He didn't preserve that little diary that that shepherd boy wrote. Was there a shepherd boy there? I don't know. I mean, it was a significant enough event that it wouldn't surprise me if other people saw it. And the Canaanites say that they, right, when, remember... Um, Rahab, Rahab she, she says, we've heard of it, but whatever reports that she heard, that wasn't scripture. It's not written down for us. But it is a record of God's events in history. There's, God's special revelation always consists of word and deed. Or, we could say, uh, act and interpretation. Or, if we're to be more specific, redemptive act and a redemptive interpretation. Right? God, God doesn't cr part the Red Sea and then leave his people guessing. I wonder why he did that. Right? God doesn't resurrect Jesus from the dead and leave us wondering why he did that. No, he's very clear why he did it. To redeem his people. To bring us into relationship with him. And so, that, so Scripture is the same, right? There's special revelatory deeds and there's special revelatory interpretation that we might know more fully what God has done in Christ. It's the greatest of all of God's special revelatory acts is the crucifixion, right? 
So then those acts are accompanied by interpretation. The Bible, the New Testament. We'll just end with this. Are there questions on the relationship between special revelation and scripture? And uh, yeah, we'll just have conversations based on that. Yeah. When Jesus returns, it's going to be a special revelatory event, right? The second coming is special revelation. Um, it's, a, it's God breaking into history in an unnatural way. So, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, I think it speaks into the continuationist, cessationist debate, certainly. Um, it speaks into it in a couple ways. Number one... Um, I think it, it allows for the continuous, continuous argument of special revel, revelation that's not scripture, right? That's continuing. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we'll get more into that as time goes on um, in this class. But yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well done. Yeah, Abel. Yeah, I think that, I think Paul, Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 calls prophecy a revelation, right? For Ephesians 3, I'm sorry, Ephesians 1, God prays that the spirit of revelation would come um, for the Ephesian believers. So there's revelatory events happening, even in the time of the New Testament, that aren't Bible, right? Which means that, I mean, unless there's books of the Bible that contain the prophet, whatever you think was happening in Corinth, you have to think that you have to agree that there, there were prophecies happening in Corinth, right? But no one wrote them down, which means they're not part of the Bible, which means they're not necessary, which means they're they're less than Scripture, right? Um, yeah. So I would say that yeah, I would say that they're special revelation that's not Scripture. I think Doggy had his hand up. Yeah. So with that, you you have to you have to say that Scripture has a unique place among all of God's special revelation. If you say that all special revelation, first of all, if you say all special revelation is equally necessary, right, which I, I feel like, and maybe I'm wrong, it seems like behind the question is an assumption, right, and we would agree with this, and the necessity of Scripture. Scripture is necessary. It's one of the, everyone agrees with this, right? Scripture is necessary for salvation. Apart from Scripture, there is no salvation. But, but to then say Scripture is necessary, Scripture is revelation, special revelation, therefore all special revelation is necessary, is a logical leap, right? So, so God might perform special revelatory acts that aren't necessary for salvation. So, so are there special revelatory acts that God has done that I don't have access to? Yes. The burning bush, right? Neither one of us have access to that, but the burning bush is not necessary for salvation. Are there miracles that Jesus did that we don't have record of? Yeah, John says that but they're not necessary for salvation. They can't be. Otherwise, we're denying. Uh, I, I'm actually saying that I, I actually think I'm, I have a, a high, very high view of Scripture right now because I'm saying that above all of God's special revelatory events, or special revelatory acts, is Scripture, right? Scrip and I think I'm agreeing with Peter when Peter says that Scripture is more, is, is, uh, um, it's more significant than the transfiguration, right? If the transfiguration is special revelation, um, I don't need that for salvation, but I do need the Bible. Does that answer your question? Yes. Any other questions about this? Yeah. 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 I, I would say because 1 Corinthians 13 and Ephesians 4 would call it that. And 1 Corinthians 14 would call it that as well, right? So um, you would have to have a Bible. You have to have a Bible verse. If you say that it ceases, right, you have to have a Bible verse that says when it ceases, and why it ceases, right? You can't, it, it's, it's an artificial category to say, I believe uh, in special revelation outside of scripture, and I believe that it, then I believe that it ceased, but the Bible doesn't tell me about it, right? You, the Bible has to tell you, the Bible has to inform, that, 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 that's a massive shift in redemptive history for the Bible to be silent on. Does that make sense? Or do you think the, do you think the Bible talks about when that happens, or no? Or is it, like, what you said was, we can infer because of this that they ceased? How do we identify it when it happens? So I would say, first and foremost, the Bible gives me the category, right, of, of what is prophecy and what is not. 
Right? So the Bible needs to tell, my Bible needs to inform me, the Bible primarily, um, and not other things. Um, but let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. Okay. So love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. So I am a cessationist in the sense that this is saying. Right? It says that they will pass away. Now the question is when. Can you see it? Okay, good. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. So that's, this is speaking of gifts of knowledge, right? We know in part that speaking of gifts of knowledge, we prophesy in part that speaking of gifts of prophecy. But when the perfect has come, the partial will pass away. So the question is, when does the perfect come? So when the perfect comes, what is partial? So what is partial is the knowledge, the gifts of knowledge and prophecy. We tracking? Okay, good. Um, if we're not, let me know. Um, and so now here's, here he gives an analogy. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. So he gives a, an analogy of a child growing up, right? It's the same that he gives in First Corinthians, or sorry, Ephesians 4, by the way, as well. Maturity, the maturity that's exactly right. It's a maturity argument. So I'm a maturity cessationist as well. I'm a cessationist, and I'm a maturity of the church cessationist, okay? For now, we see through a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then... I shall be fully known as I have, I shall be, I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. So when does the perfect come? It's when we see face to face. And it's when we know fully. Which, which I think only describes this, that can only describe the day when I see Christ face to face. And when I, I know even as, even as I have been fully known, right? So I know God, as I have been fully known. And that's what he says, which I think, I, I don't think that can describe, I, the Bible is great, I love the Bible. I'm not saying the Bible is not wonderful, but in the Bible, do I know, even as I have been fully known? I don't think so. So then he says this, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. His, his point is this, the greatest of these is love, and the chapter starts with saying that love is more important than the gifts. So I, I actually think verse 13 says that the gifts, the why is love better? Why is love the most important? Even better than faith and hope, because faith and hope will pass away. There's a day when faith turns into sight and hope turns into sight, but love will continue forever. You're not going to have faith in heaven, and you're not going to have hope in heaven, because there's nothing to have faith in, right, that you see. You see, to use the words of Paul, face to face. There's nothing to hope in either, because it, we have it. Faith, our love is more, is, love is better than faith and hope, because faith and hope cease, just like knowledge and prophecy and tongues cease. Okay, so that, that's, the te that's the text, right? It tells me it'll cease, and it tells me when it will cease. It will cease when faith and hope cease. I still have faith and hope. I still don't know, I still don't see face to face. I don't, still don't know as I have been fully known. The other text is Ephesians 4, right? Um, which says the gifts are given until, until when? This is another text about the cessation of the gifts, right? Until we attain unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ until the church. I'm, again, I'm, I'm a church maturity cessationist, but I don't think the church has this yet. And they're given, so that's the positive. Until the church has unity around the gospel, here's the negative: so that we may no longer. So they're given so that we're not like children tossed about by every wind of doctrine and human crafty, uh, cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. Is the church? tossed back and forth by false doctrine, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely it is. Have we, so therefore, we haven't reached unity of the faith. The church is battered, right? So therefore, um, therefore we still need the gifts. Yeah. I believe that the 12 
hold a unique position. But there are apostles beyond the twelve. Right? And not all apostles wrote scripture. So just because you're an apostle doesn't mean you're a scripture writer. And just because you're an apostle doesn't mean everything you say is scripture. I'm not Catholic, right? I don't think that just because you're an apostle, if you wear the special, for the Pope, you have to wear the special hat, right? But es cathedra. The apostles didn't just speak ex cathedra, right? Um, apostles were wrong, too. Peter was wrong about something very significant. So just because you're an apostle doesn't mean you're inerrant in everything that you say. Only the things that you wrote down that were scripture were you inerrant. Um, so I, I do think that apostle, the gift of apostleship continues. Um, now what that is, it's a lot to talk about today, but in short, I think they're church planters. I think apostles are church planters. That's why Barnabas is an apostle, Apollos is an apostle, Timothy's an apostle, right? They're church planters, I think. They bring the, they bring the, they bring the gospel to a new place, and they plant churches.